Hello and good evening. Some failures are funny, aren't they? I don't know about you, but I love a good collection of you've been framed mishaps. Uh, maybe you've got your own funny story of failure to tell. Mine are normally stories of a failure of social etiquette. Uh, like the time that I greeted a friend who I hadn't seen for a while and, and I thought you know we were heading for a kiss on the cheek, uh, she thought we were heading for a hug and I ended up kissing her neck. <laughs> it was a long time ago but it still makes me cringe when I, when I think about it. Yeah, some failures are funny. Some failures though, not so much. In fact, some failures leave big scars, like when we fail at work when we face discipline at work. Maybe we even have had to lose our job. Maybe we failed exams or, or tests and realised that our dreams have become unobtainable. I still remember very clearly being crushed as a teenager when I failed tests, uh, aptitude tests to become an RAF pilot. Sometimes failing in relationships can leave big scars too, can't it? Like the loss of a friend or the sadness of a broken marriage. Sometimes our failures seem so big that we don't know what to do next. We don't know what to say, where to turn, who to trust. And they leave big scars. Well, if you're not familiar with God's Word, the Bible, I have good news for you tonight. Because God's Word was written for failures. And in fact, it's full of failures from, from start through to, through to finish, which is pretty an encouraging thing because it's relevant. It means it's relevant for each and every one of us. None of us are immune to failure. The proverb says, doesn't it, to err is human. And I want to share a bit of God's word with you tonight. It's a bit where Jesus is telling a story about a father who has two, who has two sons who fail. It's a story that Jesus tells in order to, to, to teach an important spiritual truth. And in the story, the father represents God and the, the two sons represent us. So before we go any further, I'm going to ask God to help us understand what his word says. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you that your word is written for failures. And as we look at just a small part of it tonight, help us to understand what you are saying about yourself to each one of us. Soften our hearts, Lord, to hear your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. So if you have a Bible to hand and you're the kind of person who likes to follow through, then you might want to open it up at Luke chapter 15. Uh, if you don't have a Bible to hand, that's absolutely fine. The passages that I'm going to be talking about will appear on the screen as we go. And so this story, it is, it is one of the most well-known uh, in the Bible. It's often called the parable of the prodigal son. But it, that, that name is actually a bit misleading. According to Jesus, right from the off, this story is primarily about a father. The Gospel writer Luke records Jesus as saying this, there was a man who had two sons. So this parable, uh, this is a parable of a father who had two sons, not just the prodigal, but an older son as well. And the two sons, well, they represent two types of failures. Uh, you've got those who fail obviously, and those who fail not so obviously. So let's look at the first failure, uh, the, the, the first failure, who, the, the son who fails obviously. This younger son, this is the one normally known as the prodigal, says to his dad in verse 12, Father, give me the share of the property that is coming to me. And the dad, he, well, he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all that he had and he took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered this property in reckless living. <clears throat> and well, we know just how reckless that living was because prostitutes are mentioned later. So it's clear that this younger son has just one thing on his mind, himself. He wants to please himself. He wants to be free from work. He wants to be free from his obligations. And it is in this sense that he fails in his responsibility to his family and he indulges in this, in this reckless, we could say, wild living. 
They said, this is a deliberately shocking request in the story that Jesus is telling. I mean, imagine I were to go to my dad now, he's still alive, and I were to say to him, Dad, I've no idea what you've got in the bank, but when you and mum die, half of it's coming to me and half of it's coming to my sister. So let's just cut to that point now. I want my share now. What am I saying if I were to do that? I'm effectively saying, Dad, I don't want you. I, I don't care about you. In fact, all I care about is your worth to me in, in financial terms. And what I can do with the money now is way more important than what you might need it for for the rest of your life. <laughs> yeah, in fact, you are as good as dead to me now. Let's give me the money and I'm gone. Now, if you'd heard that I had said that to my dad, I'm hoping that you would uh, pull me to, to one side and say something like, John, what are you, what are you doing? It's wrong to treat your, your dad like that. You're, you're failing in your responsibilities as a son. And you'd be right to pull me to one side and say that. Uh, and if you were wise, you, you might also ask, well, but what's your long-term plan? What are you gonna do anyway when the money runs out? which is where Jesus goes next as he continues his story. Verse 14 says, and when he, that's the son, when he had spent everything, everything's gone, a severe famine arose in that country and he began to be in need. So the son went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate and no one gave him anything. What a failure. He's, he's blown it. There were good times to be sure, you know, there were buzzes, there were pleasures, there were, there were highs, the thrills, but those things didn't last, they don't last. And now his foolish selfishness, his foolish ill discipline means that the money has, he, has gone, he has no means to live on, and he also has no friends to help to be there and he finds himself alone at rock bottom. He's doing one of the most dishonorable jobs that it is possible for a Jew to do. He's feeding pigs. There is nowhere lower that this man could sink. Maybe right now you can identify with that. Maybe you are at rock bottom. Maybe your failure is obvious, if not for all to see, certainly to you. Maybe life has not turned out the way that you planned. Perhaps you're living with the consequences of decisions which you now wish you had made differently. People have been hurt along the way. Maybe the hopes and dreams that you had have, have crumbled around you and have come to nothing. Those you thought were your friends are nowhere to be seen. And you are in pain and you feel so alone. Friends, I don't want to make light of your situation in, in any way, shape or form, but is it possible, is it just possible that God is using this time to call you to your real senses, to make you aware of his presence in your life, to make you aware of your need for him. This was certainly the case for the younger son. His failure, his failings brought him to his senses. He got his things together and he went home to the most, actually to the most unbelievable reception possible, but we'll come back to that in a moment because it'll be helpful first to see another kind of failure in this story. See, as well as the son who fails, obviously, there is also the son who fails subtly. Yeah, this is the older son. And the older son was the kind of son that wouldn't have fluffed his exams at school. He didn't fail in his responsibilities to, to the family. He, he always obeyed his father, we're told. He didn't indulge in, in immoral, reckless living, and he certainly didn't fail at work. There he was working hard with his father. He was outwardly, at least, a success. And yet inwardly, subtly, something was failing quite dramatically. When he heard of his younger son's return and the party that accompanied that return, he was angry and he refused to go in and join that party. 
And that anger then expresses itself in bitterness and envy. This is what he says to his dad in, in verse 29. Look, these many years I have served you and I never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, notice how he says that, he doesn't say like when my brother, but when this son of yours dad came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. It's ugly, isn't it? And it's ugly because there's more than a hint of self-righteousness about this chap. I've played by the rules. I've not failed. Where's the reward that I deserve for that? That's what he's saying. And his failure wasn't obvious, but quietly, imperceptibly, it was growing until this moment. And here he is now on the cusp of failing, failing to love, failing to show kindness, failing to extend mercy and forgiveness. His father has, but him, his world's, no, his world's a little bit more black and white than his father's, because in his world there are bad people who are obvious failures. You know, the corrupt politicians, the bent coppers, the, the child abusers, the, the drug pushers, the, the, the pimps, the lockdown rule breakers. You know, the bad people, the obvious failures, they need to be punished. But the good people, the good people who aren't, um, you know, obvious failures, they, they, the ones who have a veneer of respectability about them, who, who pass their exams, who, who contribute to society, who, who raise good children, who never do anything wrong, you know, who, who pay their taxes, who work hard, they, the good people, they should be rewarded. And the truth is, that such distinctions are utterly false in God's eyes. We're all failures. Yes, some failures are more visible than others, but none of us are free from failure. Because our instinct, our default position, our drive is to always do what we want, when we want to do it, how we want to do it. We want to do what we think is best. And in doing so, in concentrating on ourselves, we fail to love the one who created us. We fail to the one, love the one who knows what is best for us, who knows us best. And we also fail to love and treat others around us as we long to be loved and treated ourselves. This is the true state of things. And it all sounds pretty depressing, doesn't it? Is there any hope here in, in Jesus' story? Is there any hope in this book of failures? You bet there is. Because we look at what the Father's welcome is to all failures in this story. Look at the Father's welcome. Firstly, to the obvious failure. Who, Jesus tells us, comes to his senses he realizes that, that his dad's servants have a better life than he does, and he hatches a plan to return to his dad, confessing his obvious failure. This is verse 20. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. What a welcome. Then verse 22, the, fa the father said uh, to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his finger and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate for this my son was dead and he's alive again. He was lost and he's now found and they began to celebrate. What a dad. <laughs> what a dad. What a welcome. I've got to confess, I'm not this kind of dad. I, I, I want to be for sure, but, but I don't think you'd catch me dividing my inheritance early. Sorry, lads, to take note, but I, I don't think you would do that. I don't think I'd linger long in the road looking, hoping for my son to return. I think initially I would, but I, I fear I'd give up too soon. I'd, be, I'd certainly be wary of believing that lame little speech that he'd been practicing all, all, the, all the way home. And I, I certainly wouldn't throw a party first without at least sitting down with my son and saying, well, you know, what went wrong? Look, these are the consequences of what went wrong. You know, how are we going to be able to stop all this happening again? That's what I do. This is no ordinary father, though. This is no ordinary father. 
The Father that Jesus is describing here is none other than God himself. And his love for us is so great, it is so strong, it is so important that nothing can come in the way, come in the way of a reunion with a truly repentant son. Nothing. With repentance comes reconciliation. With reconciliation comes reunion. And reunions are special things. I don't know if you've ever had an enforced separation from a loved one. I've had my fair share of them during my time in, in the Royal Air Force. And I tell you something, that first hug, that first kiss, that reunion after a long period of separation is so special. It's so emotional. Maybe you have a, a similar experience that you can relate to. And that is what God is, is longing for. And if you don't know him yet, or if you have turned your back on him and you are realizing the spiritual poverty of your current position, then I, I urge you, look up. Look up, because there in the middle of the road stands a father, your heavenly father. He's straining his eyes to the horizon and he is searching for those failures whose hearts are, are truly repentant. And his arms are outstretched and they are ready to embrace you. They are ready to celebrate your return home. No matter what you have done, no matter what you have thought, no matter what you have said, this is the incredible reality of how God welcomes the obvious failure. But his welcome to the subtle failure is no less stunning. Because the Father meets the anger and the self-righteousness of the subtle failure with gentle compassion. He comes, he draws near to him, and he meets him where he is, and he pleads with him. He pleads with him to see things from his point of view. Verse 31 says, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. You've, you, you have, you've been living your reward, he's saying. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead, and is alive now. He was lost, and he's found. In other words, are you going to come and join the party too? There is much to celebrate. You've always been welcome and you still are welcome. And with that, Jesus' story ends. He leaves it hanging. And just like Jesus' original listeners, you are left to work out which son you are most like. I said at the start that God's word is full of failures, and it is, but with one obvious exception. There is one man in it who never failed. In the beginning of this book, it is promised that he will come. In the middle of this book, he, he does come, and he lives, and he dies, and the claim is that he rose again from the dead. And at the end of this book, it is promised that he will come again. He is, of course, the God-man Jesus. He is the very one who is telling us this parable. And we'd love to tell you more about him. So uh, if you are interested, please head over to our website, whyjesus.org.uk. There you'll find some videos, you'll find some free resources. And there's some information about some online sessions that we run where you can come along and you can ask any question that you have about Christianity. So do check out that website. But in closing tonight, let me say this. I don't know how you have failed. I don't need to know. It might be obvious. It might not be obvious. But I know you have failed because we all do. And God, your heavenly Father, knows that you have failed. And the truth of this story is that whatever your failures have been, there is always a way back to love, to forgiveness, to a glorious welcome from your heavenly Father who created you and knows you better than you know yourself. And that way back isn't easy. It requires humility. It requires repentance. It requires us to do something but friends if you turn to the Lord with all your heart your reception is guaranteed 
God can't do anything else because it is in his very nature to love and to forgive you and to welcome you with open arms. But it's not just that he can't do anything else, it's what he wants to do. He is longing, he is standing there looking for that return and he will be overjoyed when you do. So come home, come and join the party and you won't be alone because guess what? The party is already full of failures. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this story. We thank you for the welcome that you give to failures. Help us to see tonight what you need us to see, Lord, and help us to respond with humility and repentance. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.